Hello, can uh, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. How do you pronounce the surname? Poirier? My, my name is Jean-Tien Poirier, but uh, Jeff uh, is easier. It's faster, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm too English for anything complicated. I apologize. No problem, no problem. Yeah, I'm going to make you co-host. Yep. Does that work? Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can. Great. Okay. Yep. So uh, over to you. Thanks. No, oh, thanks, Nathan. Um, so um, my talk today will be of using R for health economics modeling in consulting industry. So are we there yet? So I'm Jean-Tien Poirier. JEP uh, is easier, as I said. I'm the executive director for HOR modeling here at uh, Par Excel. The usual disclaimer is that uh, the deck represents my experience. It's a bit more than what we do here uh, exactly in the company, but um, it's not necessarily all the opinion of, of my employer. HUR consulting, and when I say HUR, it's really the general consulting. I know there are some consulting firms that are really specialized in R. And so some of the things that I will talk about here are maybe not applicable. Obviously, we will see why. But in general, HR consulting, and this is applicable for consulting in R, it's an interesting intersection in modeling because we are kind of uh, having different inputs from clients, from HTA agencies, uh, from academia, from cool stuff and side project that we would like to to do and then well in consulting there are billable hours so we need to justify every single hour that we are that we are uh, producing so my talk will really see three different uh, aspects um, of consulting and it all started with uh, interviews so for the last eight months we were interviewing about 120 130 people at two different levels uh, one, it's really at a beginner level uh, for um, associates, what, what do you say? And then the second bit is for consultant. Um, so it's mid-career level with five to uh, seven years of experience in, in health economics modeling. And one of the questions that we ask in these interview is... Um, a simple kind of visual analog scale for knowledge of R. So on a scale from zero to 10, how do you rate your skills in R? <clears throat> if you don't know what R is, just answer zero. And if you are an R guru that you can teach us, all of us, uh, something new in, in R, then use 10. And this is a very simple, very simple scale. Um, when we ask the, um, the entry level, the newcomers, um, which is usually a master, now a master in health economics, we didn't have any statisticians per se in this. Um, it's not a sample, so I will show you distribution, but they are not uh, statistically validated. But we observed this kind of distribution with a few saying, no, I don't know. Fortunately, in a way, none saying after a master, no, I, I can't teach actually R to everyone and, and even those with years of experience. But we observed that the most of the people rate themselves around six, seven, and nine. And we have around 80 candidates uh, in this pool. Uh, the interesting bit, and, and when we started to interview consultants, um, we saw something very uh, interesting happening, is that the distribution shifted a little bit towards the left. And so no zero, no one. Uh, and very few, uh, if none, uh, 10. But the distribution shifted a little bit towards the five and the six. And in the beginning, we didn't notice that because with one or two, well, it's uh, just, uh, but then when we had, we started to have five, six uh, candidates saying, well, actually I'm a bit less than what the newcomers were saying. We started to uh, ask them, well, why do you rate yourself uh, as such. And I think that um, one of the reasons that was mentioned uh, repetitively is that, well, when we come out of university with a year or two of experience, we may think that we know more. And this, but the, the, the environment uh, for R in HOR modeling is so vast that actually we realize slowly, slowly that we don't know 
uh, much. Um, and so where are we now when, when we start to onboard new um, commerce is that um, I, I think that there is still a skill gap to, to, to bridge in the self-assessment of, of uh, candidates. And this was, of course, we, we don't rely only on the self-assessment. Uh, whenever someone says, oh, I'm an eight in R in HEOR, okay, fine, what do you know? What are the different packages that you are using? Can you give us some um, experience that you had, some reimbursement submission, et cetera? And, and this is where the interesting discussion, of course, starts. Um, and so because we can't do any uh, talk without a meme, maybe, uh, so there is a interesting meme that when we had when we started to perceive um th this strange different distribution with newcomers uh, we were wondering okay fine why are you just saying you know more uh are than uh, more advanced people um so th the next step in this um journey is following new r modelers uh, new modelers are coming into the the team um, and they have a lot to assimilate whatever their uh, initial status is. Um, and why is that? Is one of the reasons is that uh, Paraxel is not only um, health economics modeling, it's mainly actually a clinical trial company, clinical trial where you have an extensive or you start to have an extensive use of R and R in an open source fashion also. Um, and so we are bound to some of the rules and regulation that the clinical trial biostatisticians have. We are bound, it seems maybe negative, but actually we take it as a very positive side because actually we can benefit from all this environment um, of transparency, of repeatability, of reproducibility, of traceability of what we are doing. So when newcomers are coming, whether it's in R or in Excel, they have a lot of new things to learn. And in R, they need, of course, to know R. R Studio is our main workhorse, but we use the whole tidyverse. We'll use Styler, we use Testdat, we use GitLab for our main re repository. And since Friday, we are thinking of inserting or using Assert HE to be added to the, to the workflow. How do we start? For those who already know, these packages are, it's quite easy. We can give them um, a project, an internal project. And usually it's, please, can you show us, reproduce a model that is existing, that is published, that is QC'd in R. Um, and so we can very quickly see where the gaps are and where the new learning has to happen. Uh, for those who are beginning from scratch or, or nearly scratch. And, and what we see usually is when they come directly from uh, some university, they know base R, they know ggplot, for instance, they know some R markdown, but the R packages are really uh, missing or how to start a um, model in, in R. And so what we um, we do is we, we take the um, pearl growing method so we, we start with a, a few basic modeling videos, I'll come to that, uh, in R without any package and in order to understand really what is there and how do can we do a simple model with, uh, with R. And then we grow from there. Oh, by the way, for this, I don't know how reproducible it is. I incorporated the data directly in the, in the, um, in the code, how to extract that and put it outside oh I can do everything I'm I'm reaching the PSA there are issues how can I solve that um, and so we we grow little by little in by base air are first and then we grow the knowledge with uh, different packages afterwards our main um Pearl, the first pearl that we have is uh, decision analytic modeling held in health economics courses very short videos, very well explained with a lot of code samples developed by Tristan Snowsill. And this is a great resource if you want to coach someone for uh, your for your next health economics modeling. 
we are not developing our own course in internally. This is not what we are in for. And when we have a model in R, R accompany R and the R ecosystem accompanies our model development from start to finish. Uh, so we start from the TPP, so the target product profile analysis, data gap analysis, data extraction, model programming, basically QC, and then all the technical report and uh, model adaptation. We can have all the packages used here. Uh, we start really at the model skeleton, at the conceptualization. We started to use our markdown um, and having reports. Why? Because then it can quickly um, drive the conclusion, the, the writing of the, the final report and the adaptations. Now, as I mentioned, we are bound by um, the rules and the processes that uh, our biostatisticians colleague in uh, clinical trial are uh, submitted to. And so for the moment, we are letting um, our new colleagues work a bit freely on the package they want, on the uh, type of analysis that they, they want when they develop their own first model. After that, and this is why I put, we have all the standards, SOP processes that in a way, unfortunately, are there. All the internal R programming guidelines and repository, etc., that we are putting and trying to teach afterwards, but that uh, at one point we will need to bombard in the beginning of the journey uh, everyone because, well, that's how regulated the environment. And then Similarly to the previous uh, speakers, we are we are facing with some issues in uh, as we cannot choose necessarily the R version that we use. The packages have, and we'll come that to a panel this afternoon. The the package has a uh, four steps towards um, the nirvana where they can be used. They are tested, they are followed, and they can be used for um, regulatory uh, processing and therefore for us they can be used in our um, our uh, submissions. So let's say the candidate was successfully onboarded as a newcomer. We have a new R project from beginning to end. Now how do we go for submission? And I'm was super happy to learn a few things from the previous talk because uh, in um, healthcare intervention reimbursement, there isn't much for the reason evoked before, there isn't much that are written black on white uh, in um, on the guidelines. So NICE accept black on white R and they have a lot of material available. Equig take an interesting perspective from their guidelines is that actually the technical documentation should be in a such way that the model can be replicated independently of a specific software. So we interpret it and, and when we ask with past equic, um, when we discuss with past equic uh, people, we kind of see that R would be accepted provided the technical documentation is, is uh, well done. And uh, as you learned, as we all learned um, in the previous uh, talk, the ZIN guidelines are, um, of course, well advanced in this uh, space. However, um, when we have a, a model, we sometimes use the, we sometimes also have the adaptation for a few, a number of, uh, of countries. And most HEA agencies are still perceived as they will only accept MS Excel. So I'm sitting in Belgium. Uh, when I discuss with the uh, regulatory agency, the reimbursement agency here in Belgium, some of the individual will say, will be excited. Yes, please come with a model in R. I'm interested to see. This, is, this will be a way to uh, improve R, my R knowledge. But most of the models are still developed in Excel. And one of the other reason is that if you go back to the beginning, when a large pharmaceutical company thinks, okay, I will start to develop what, the, what we call a global model that will, will therefore after that will be adapted for local as a local model, as kind of forks of the global model. 
it's of course more efficient in terms of budget to have one Excel model that you can adapt into 25 um, Excel local adaptations rather than one R model, one Excel model, and then you need to um, uh, adapt one of them um, it, depending on how the agency are uh, working. One of the notable exception to that is um, reimbursement of vaccines. So vaccines are not really the, it's a kind of niche um, modeling um, in HOR and in reimbursement in the fact that we are, of course, using decision tree, of course, this using Markov models, um, but we are also using, we are also using, sorry, dynamic transition model. Why? Because we are using herd immunity. So herd immunity is the fact that um, people who are immune to the disease will protect, in a way, um, people from get susceptible people, not infected, from getting the infection. Uh, this is uh, demonstrating here. When there is no vaccination, one infectious people will infect uh, his neighbors in this uh, space-based transmission or air-based transmission, while when people are immune or vaccinated, um, the um, infected individual will have difficulties transmitting to the other susceptible. It's kind of a shield from, uh, from there. One important model, as I mentioned, is the uh, dynamic transition model. This is a typical SIR, so susceptible, infected, and removed individual. We can model this in um, a Markov way, if if you want, and in, in a way, in a high level, um, the dynamic transition model is kind of a Markov model, but there is no, a lot of things are, are absent there. Um, and what we have with us very simple SIR is uh, in after a number of days, uh, you have an infection in here in red and the number of susceptible decrease and then re-increase uh, after that. And of course, the number of uh, individual removed, also vaccinated, etc., is increasing and uh, is staying in the in the in the population. So how R can help us here? Uh, these models are based on um, differential equation, and um, you can do with difficulty Excel model um, with um, dynamic with um, dynamic equation. So the package dissolve is at the center of our vaccine model, and how it works is that basically you encapsulate your model in a function. Uh, here we call it the Lorentz function because that's Lorentz described this type of uh, prey predator, this work also for a prey predator um, type of model. Um, and you describe here your uh, S, I, and R and how they are interacting with each other. And then you solve the model by using the ODE integration function. Um, this is, to my knowledge, not possible in, in R. It is possible, of course, in uh, several other uh, packages like MATLAB and Mathematica. So the acceptance of dynamic transistor model varies by HTA. Um, in, 2020, in 2012, sorry, uh, NICE and PHA introduced maternal immunization against pertussis based on a dynamic model that was built uh, in MATLAB. And PBAC in Australia reintroduced an 18 month vaccine dose against DTP, uh, also using a dynamic model, but in MATLAB. Many HPV vaccines, for instance, for the moment are reimbursed, reimbursed with a dynamic transmission cost effectiveness model as the base for the cost effectiveness um, dossier. And some are written in R. I put it as a reference uh, one of the newest publications in, in that field. But it varies. Uh, R is not just because we have a uh, vaccine, therefore herd immunity is interesting, and then dynamic transition model are uh, what we need to do. We still need to assess, is the um, dynamic model really the uh, way to um, demonstrate the value of the vaccine? And for instance, the two recent RSV vaccines that were recommended by ACIP in the US, I know it's not really an HTA 
uh, agency, uh, but still they assess the cost effectiveness of these two RSV vaccines. Both of them were done in Excel as the companies decided that um, it would not be uh, the dynamic transition model will not add additional value at ACIP. And one thing that maybe we should start uh, doing is also update our own uh, reports. Uh, so the report on dynamic transition modeling from the ISPOR SMDM uh, societies dates from 2012. They mention explicitly MATLAB, so a decade ago, uh, sorry, R, R and MATLAB and C++, of course. Uh, R was already mentioned a decade ago, um, not yet Python, maybe the next in the next uh, version. Um, and it mentioned great flexibility in terms of assumption, calibration, uncertainty analysis. Um, this is great. Uh, it still mentioned things that I believe uh, we came from since then. Uh, for instance, most development uh, require a lot of development effort. I think compared to an Excel model for people who are used to Excel model, yes. Um, and also the programs, the software may lack transparency uh, for those not familiar with this, this environment. This starts to become less and less true as people start to understand and as we are helped by many different tools to um, to uh, explain the models. I was very interested to see that uh, Zinn, for instance, in the previous talk, was not um, interested in having the model as a package, for instance, or as a script, but really you need to show them, and not as a, a shiny package neither, but really show them step by step how you do it in a more readable way. And so R allows for that, uh, something that is maybe more difficult in other uh, software packages mentioned in the uh, uh, guidelines here. So using R for health economics in consulting, are we there yet? Progress have been made. Um, the R ecosystem is more and more user-friendly as a growing number of new health economics know R, at least a little bit, and a growing number of HTA agency allow R explicitly. And if I may boil down only to one recommendation, is that for me, a more structured learning approach is needed because it will mean that all newcomers to modeling in R will be available on the job market, whether they are in consulting, in pharma, or if they go and uh, work for an HTA agency. So is it the end of Excel domination? It's almost over. I can't give you a timeline for when it will be over. So thank you very much. Um, and if there are any questions, feel free to ask uh, here in the chat or, or directly go by contacting me. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Very interesting. A lot of things to think about. Um, should we just go to the chat, shall we? Uh, if, yeah, if you've got any questions, put it in the chat. So I'm, I'm doing it in reverse order. Um, so um, how do you validate these types of complexes from Ibrahim? How do you validate these types of complex markup models when there's lots of scenarios? That's a good question because there are several aspects there. Um, so we have a QC uh, template specifically or developed from the RQC, our RQC template, but um, specifically for R and R intricacies. We are using, when the model needs to go out, we are using validated um, uh, packages, validated either by the HTA agency as we saw before, then it's dictated there or validated internally by our Biostat team. Uh, so they, they have a comprehensive step-by-step -step approach where they say, okay, the code that is used to build these package seems to be working um, as expected. Um, to be honest with you, I've never requested um, the validation of a package. I assume the process is, is well done because I see all the regulatory submission for clinical trial analysis being done um, and working and, and all the QC process has been uh, validated by external agencies also. But my question remains still, how will we integrate modelers into the validation of um, health economics models 
um, or Antigone mix package by biostatisticians. They can bring their formidable our knowledge and statistical knowledge. I still believe that health economics should bring some of the um, of the domain expertise uh, for for the validation. Other than that, for the moment, at least if I understand correctly the question, our uh, validation of a Markov model follows a classical Excel model validation process with a lot of uh, branches done specifically for for our model. One also um, um, maybe side note is that uh, so far the validation of our model that I have been part of were done where our model was replicating an Excel model or where both models were done in parallel because the client wanted double programming. And therefore there were a lot of um, results and I'm trying to address the scenario uh, part of the question, uh, results within the scenario where we could see, well, they are similar or not. Um, and I think we had a talk last uh, Friday about exactly the same, no, um, but giving similar results. And why is that? Is because some of the functions are, are calculating things differently in, in R and in, in Excel. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask, quickly about you showed the um the icon for test that and that that was one of the packages that people use i mean how, how do you incorporate that into the model development and the and the testing yes so we we are incorporating for the moment really in an ad hoc way um i wouldn't be necessarily very proud to show the test coverage of our models but we are um mainly developing in parallel the test and the function. I know this is not how some people recommend to develop first the unit tests for very specific um, or the most atomic uh, thing possible. Um, and then you have also larger tests where the whole mark of trace, especially when uh, we have a, um, a model that was replicated or the R model is a replication of uh, then we can test if um, the trace and, and results of scenario are, are correctly done. Um, yeah, good. Um, I'm just going to send you some one last question from Howard. So how dependent is support at uh, Paracel for R on an individual champion? Because he's found that companies and HCA agencies, uh, agencies that individual senior people are valuable, but progress could be lost if they move on. So it's kind of points of failure. Yes. Um, and I think that this is a, a very valid point and something that uh, I encourage you to ask when you, you ask a consultant to, to work on an R model, but on any kind of model, if you have a specific, uh, I don't know, multiple sclerosis model, maybe it depends also on one very uh, um, acute specialist independently of the software used. Um, so how we deal with that? We deal with that with um, extensive documentation we deal with that with a central repository uh, so that at least the uh, knowledge is not lost or we have suddenly 35 version and we can't really rely on the date it was uh, because that's not the most, that's not how it's done. Um, and the last bit that we are not doing for the moment, but it is in planning is really the um, transmission of small and small pieces. So for um, our for instance, for our team meeting, we have now 20 minutes out of it that is there to explain something from past experience, past project to the others. And so the plan is to take some of the bits that were de we developed in R and to transmit that to, the, to our other team uh, members so that at least the knowledge of um, R for the team inc increases. Mm. Okay, sounds sensible. Great. Okay, so we'll leave it there. There might be some more questions in the chat if you want to have a look, Jeff, but thank you very much. Yep. Thank you very much.